when we take the majority, we have to fight. We have to show people what, how we will fight if we get the White House, not how we negotiate the surrender when we're in charge. Congressman, thanks for coming on the Gun Politics Podcast. I know it's a busy, busy day here in the swamp, and uh, as always, and and thanks for coming over. Well, thanks for having me on, Patrick. Yeah, we've got a busy day in judiciary. It's like when you're fighting gun control in Congress, there's almost not a day where they're not trying to ban guns. <laughs> uh, yes, ab- absolutely. So um, we're right in the middle of probably the biggest assault in our Second Amendment rights and decades, really. I mean, we've had little nibbles here and there. And on the House side, Pelosi and them went went for it all. You're right in the thick of it. You're going to head to head with these anti-gunners. Just What's it like if, a, if I'm a gun owner out there watching this? You're a congressman. Like, you know, how does it go day to day? Well, first of all, you should understand that the House floor, the rules are rigged on the House floor. There's almost no opportunity to get an amendment offered and put the Democrats on their heels. So the fight happens in Judiciary Committee. Uh, there's there's nobody there who can strike down your effort to put them on their heels. They could try to rule amendments when you offer them non-germane. But um, anyways, the fight's in Judiciary. There are uh, several good people on there, like Andy Biggs and Chip Roy. Jim Jordan's a ranking member. Um, and we try to just keep them moving back. Sometimes we're the speed bump. And um, that's the way it was a couple of weeks ago and last week when they passed two different gun bills through our committee. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting there. It was a hastily called Judiciary Committee a couple of weeks ago. Somebody told me you got up at like four in the morning and, and yeah. flew out here. And it's I'm sitting second row. I walk in. I'm like, OK, I got a seat here. And it's you. It's Gates. It's Jim Jordan. It's Dan Bishop. They got Louie Gohmert coming in on Zoom. Yeah. We got Chip Roy against Nadler and Swalwell, like all gun owners out there are like, man, this is like, this is the battle. And you got to be on your game, data, points, everything. And and you guys were, I mean, it was, we, it was pretty fun to watch. They tried a quarterback sneak on this one because Congress was in recess and they noticed this hearing with like 48 hours in advance. Right. So we had 48 hours to cancel, you know, town halls or anything that you had planned back in the district and try and book a plane and get up here. Mm. And the Democrats and a lot of Republicans were forced to do it by Zoom, but I don't have much of an excuse. I'm in Kentucky. I could, you know, get in a car and drive here right. if I had to. So I got here. There was um, Jim Jordan was here in person and, and Matt Gates, and we had a good contingency. <laughs> Amendments. So in that Judiciary Committee, and, and I could be wrong on my numbers, but I think it's 24 Democrats to 20, 19 or 20 19, Republicans. 19, 20 Republicans. You had prepared four amendments in, in in that committee, and I thought one was very interesting. It could be key to our Second Amendment battle against these people. It dealt with the ATF. Um, talk about that amendment, how you and your staff prepare for a committee yeah. like that. Well, let me describe the the six bills that okay. were in the gunnibus, right. like not an omnibus. I started out in my opening statement by pointing out that none of the six titles would actually do anything to stop the shootings that they're supposed to be responsive to. So they introduced six bills in one bill to kind of make up for it in volume. Since none of them will work, let's just bedazzle everybody and do six things at once. Right. Um, the The first provision in the bill, they call them titles, the first title was basically to deny constitutional rights to anybody who's 18, 19, or 20. It's already illegal by federal law to buy handgun from an FFL. The first, this first title in their provision would extend that to long guns. So any shotgun or rifle that's a semi-automatic and takes a detachable magazine. So they're calling that like an assault weapons ban right. for uh, people under 21. You should begin to understand that they are going to call everything an assault weapon um, because it's any semi-automatic that takes a magazine. And scary looking. Scary looking, yes. <laughs> that was one provision in the bill. There was... Uh, a provision to ban homemade guns, ghost guns, as they call them, right. 3D printed guns. Uh, there was a provision in the bill that seems redundant until you start looking at it. Anytime the Democrats introduce a bill and make something a crime that's already a crime, you have to look at what new thing are they trying to capture in this bill that goes above and beyond. And so that was the case with the gun trafficking bill. 
they create a new crime of of gun trafficking but it's already illegal to uh lie on your 4473 and say you're buying that gun for yourself if you intend to give it to somebody else who's right. not a member of your family for instance so uh, those were a few of the provisions uh this <laughs> they're slipping out of my head i should have brought a, a, a list of them uh Let's see, 3D, uh, they'll come to me later, as probably as we talk about the amendments, because yeah. I remember my amendments on these bills. Yeah, yeah. another amendment, I think, was- Oh, oh, sorry. Got sorry to story. interrupt. The yeah, worst no, no. The worst provision in here, the uh, the worst title in here, the most unconstitutional. It's already, this this title of their bill is already has already been ruled unconstitutional by the Heller decision. And that the title that I'm speaking of is called, they call it the Safe Storage right. Act, where it requires you to have your guns locked up at home. The criminals would would absolutely love this bill to happen. This is, and I, and I also pointed out all six of these bills have the flaw that uh, criminals don't follow gun laws, right? The, the, the gun laws are the least of their worries if they're gonna murder somebody. All they do is infringe on uh, law-abiding citizens' rights. But in this case, it would be, it would be beneficial to a home invader to know that a law-abiding citizen is going to take 90 seconds at least to access their firearm. I'm fumbling with it. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the reason it's uh, already unconstitutional is Heller rule in the Heller ruling, they said that DC's requirement that Dick Heller keep his gun disassembled and unloaded right. infringed went too far uh, on the second amendment. So those are four of them uh, that, oh, I know why I forgot. <laughs> This one, closing the bump stock loophole, right. uh, they've already banned that administratively. They just want to do that by, uh, you know, by congressional law. And then finally, large capacity magazines. And my my colleague, Greg Stubbe, did a great job. If anybody's seen that clip. Yes. He, he had great. to do his uh, testimony or his questioning from home. But the benefit of being in his own home is he could get out <laughs> guns and show the Democrats the things that they never even you know touched or used um unless they've been in a gang which is possible yeah. for some of these democrats but um and he pointed out he, he would bring out you know various firearms sig a glock and show them that their magazine capacity ban and that's the the last provision in this bill would outlaw basically make just a common glock or a sig illegal Right. Because they are designed to take magazines that are greater than 10 rounds. So this is how they effectively ban certain firearms by banning the magazines they take. Um, and unlike the magazine ban in 1994 that went along with the so-called assault weapons ban, this, it, this would not allow you to transfer magazines that were in existence. So if you have one, you can mm. keep it. But if you try to give it to somebody, sell it to somebody, eh, go straight to jail, federal yeah. violation. Um, the reason I think uh, Greg Stubbe, you know, the reason I say he did such a good job is they actually changed the bill. There are only two people that got this bill changed in that committee. Me with one of my amendments and Greg Stubbe by demonstrating the ridiculousness and how many guns they were gonna end up banning with this large capacity magazine ban. So between the Judiciary Committee markup and when the bill hit the Rules Committee, they changed the capacity from 10 to 15. Wild, wild and, stuff. Yeah. And I know when he brought those guns up, maybe I was dozing off a little bit. Yeah. You look, you yeah. Know, right. It's like, oh, the SIG. And, you know, I was, was kind of jealous because I was in the committee and you kind of, they would frown upon, you know, you should have zoomed in doing that in the committee. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You could have done it. Now, here's, you know, and let me just give you an example of why the, these laws don't work. Uh, the, in fact, I had to represent the committee and the rules committee uh, as the adversary to Nadler. After a bill comes out mm. of its committee of jurisdiction, in this case, ju judiciary, it goes through another committee, rules committee, where they stack the rules against you. Yeah. But there's a debate that happens there that, that not too many people watch, but you can score some points. Mm. And the chairman of that committee, uh, he said, "This, th you know, we need this bill, this large capacity magazine bank, to stop shootings like the one at Virginia Tech." Well, there's just one problem with that: the the shooter at Virginia Tech had 17 magazines. Most of them were 10 round, That's right. and there were a couple 15 rounders. And none of the magazines that were used at Virginia Tech would have been banned by this bill. Was this McGovern? Yes, who said that. Yes. Uh, 
And then they also, if you look at Columbine, they I think it was like a, a carbine right. that uh, one of the shooters carried, and he had 13 10 round magazines. Mm. So it's the radical left. I mean, they're just they're fed these talking points yeah. by every town and hog and all these people, and it's just I think the more we have actual gun people like you and Stuby and and maybe Clyde and some other people's around, you know, uh, the Hill. I mean, you may know who I'm, you may know who they are better than I do, but like that information is really good to just slap them, you know, yeah. slap them back, you know, politically speaking. So well, and they they don't like to hear the information because they've got all their preconceived notions yeah. that are wrong, like their talking points. One of the talking points they used is that uh, crime went down. Uh, during the 1994 to 2004 right. assault weapons ban because of the so-called assault weapons ban. Now, crime did go down, but it wasn't because of the assault weapons ban because only like 3% of uh, you know crime, gun, gun shootings, homicides uh, involve a long gun. Mm. And that's what the so-called assault weapons ban was about. The other problem with their statistics, or they don't use statistics. They don't actually attach numbers to this. <laughs> they would be easily proven wrong so they just right. use words and emotions but the other problem with their thesis that from 94 to 2004 the reduction in in um i don't even want to call it gun violence it's violence uh um in reduction in homicides and, and shootings is that the number of so-called assault weapons in the possession of citizens in the united states more than doubled during that period of time right because within two years manufacturers had already overcome the cosmetic ban on grenade launchers, bayonet lugs, you know, there's not much crime committed with a bayonet or a grenade launcher in the United States. <laughs> right. uh, and and flash hiders, if you will, they changed yeah. those to muzzle brakes. It, it was virtually the same guns were, were being manufactured in large quantity by 1996. And by 2004, there were far more AR-15 style firearms than there were uh before the assault weapons ban so so just it just doesn't add up and one thing i was thinking as you're talking about this you got nadler and you know i'm i'm nobody there but i'm sitting directly from nadler and i got my little yeah i saw on. you in the in the and, hearing and i swear he like and just like but anyways i i don't know but he he said one of the craziest things there's a lot of crazy things that were said but it was the 18 year old yeah. brain mush i don't know if it was you yeah or no Gates i walked engaged him, with him I, I walked him into this <laughs> Yeah. Uh, as a result of an amendment. So this is this is why being on that committee is important and why um, it's important which amendments you choose. Mm. Now, you know, would I like to offer an amendment to do X, Y or Z, get rid of the NFA tax, you know, the ban on short barrel <laughs> rifles, right. et cetera, et cetera. I would love to do that amendment, but that's not the goal in this in this hearing. First of all, you have to survive the the, it's the germanity. It's got to be germane to the bill or they can just throw your amendment out and you haven't made much of an effort. Yeah. So it's got to be germane to the bill. And your goal is either to get them to change their bill, to reduce the severity of the bill to the degree you can kind of triage or just make them take bad votes, mm -hmm. make them to point out their hypocrisy by making them take these votes because you can force the roll call. And we almost always do in that committee just to drag them. Yeah. So. Uh, I offered an amendment to your point on the brains being mush uh, that, you know, they they had a provision in the bill that said that uh, this is, by the way, on the title of the bill that bans long guns for 18, 19 and 20 year olds. They said, unless you're a member, active member of the armed services, they would allow you to have a personal firearm. And um, I said, but wait, this is um, <laughs> you're telling us. Nadler said that, and, and several of the Democrats said that the brains of 18, 19, and 20 year olds aren't fully formed. <laughs> and we pointed out that they let them vote and would like to extend that to 16 year olds, that, like in HR1, right. one of the bills they had already passed. That's That was their goal, was to lower the voting age. So um, we said, well, if the brains aren't fully formed, why are we, why can they die for our country? We're going to give them uh, the, the, uh, the uh, responsibility to uh, protect our freedoms um, and to defend our country, but we're not going to let them acquire the means to defend themselves. And I said, this is hypocrisy. And I offered an amendment to exempt not just 
active members of the military, but also anybody who signed up for selective service. Mm. And this, is, like this is where we got into the back and forth with Nadler. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nadler said the brains weren't fully formed. And I said, well, are you telling me we are uh, we are recruiting people whose brains aren't f fully formed? And he said, yes. And I said, are you telling me we are drafting people whose brains aren't fully formed? And he said, yes. And he's and I said, <laughs> should we be doing that? I asked him if he would co-sponsor uh, a, a bill with me to raise the age of the draft to 21. And he said, no. Mm. And I said, so you're telling me that you're going to uh, draft people whose brains aren't fully formed. <laughs> and he said, yes, we need to. The country needs it. Yes. <laughs> like, so that's the, uh, you know, those are the opportunities when you do go back and forth with people. Sometimes they commit candor and they say what they're really thinking. Yeah. Uh, the other amendment that I offered to that particular bill was to exempt not just uh, active members of the military, but their spouses. OK, so let's say the head of the household is deployed. It's overseas. Everybody in the community knows it. It's usually a point of pride, but also the bad guys know it. Mom is home. She 20 year old mom. Husband is overseas. Why are we going to tell her that her husband could be could could die overseas? protecting this country, and we're going to deprive her of the right to protect her and her family. I said, we need an exemption for that. Every Democrat voted against it. Yeah. yeah. So that 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 shows you. So that's the goal of, of some of the amendments is to do that. The other amendment that I offered, third of, of four, was a uh, to their gun trafficking provision. The Democrats are always talking about uh, domestic violence and how to prevent it. And so I offered an exemption to the gun trafficking because they already had two exemptions in there. They said, if you transfer it to a uh, immediate family member, and I think it goes all the way to niece or nephew, but no further, uh, they, th that you could transfer the gun to immediate family member and not be a gun trafficker, or you could transfer it to like a business associate. I think this was to anticipate if a rancher buys has firearms and then gives them to one of the the farm hands to okay. shoot a coyote then they're not gun traffickers right they said all right well if you've got these two exemptions i think we need to add a third we need to add one for domestic violence victims yeah and i said why would because what the gun trafficking provision does that the uh um that the straw purchasing you know law doesn't cover already is it extends it to 10 years, but it also would punish the person who receives the firearm. Right. So not only would they prevent somebody who's a victim of domestic violence from becoming further victimized with this bill, they would prosecute them for gun trafficking if, say, their neighbor gave them a gun to help them protect themselves because they couldn't get there soon enough or something, couldn't get to a gun store or otherwise acquire the firearm. I said, why don't we have another exception in here? You've covered family members. You've covered the ranchers. Let's cover domestic violence victims. And um, this was actually this actually turned out to be a bipartisan amendment because okay. one Democrat who I think has a close election voted okay. for my amendment. And this is the other thing you do. You put them in the, you know, in the crosshairs in their elections at the ballot box for uh in primaries and generals, if they vote against domestic violence victims, which all, you know, 23 of the 24 Democrats did. And some of these votes, too, could put them in the bad graces of their radical left funders, right? That's you know, right. Piss them off and say, hey, we're not giving you any money and deprive them of resources. I mean, you know, I don't know how their side works necessarily, <laughs> but that could be the case, right? You it's know? very so, intolerant. They, I mean, they, they eat their own over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, then the final amendment um, that I offered was by the time I beat him up on domestic violence, no pun intended, was legislative <laughs> violence, I guess, in yeah. there, and, and made them take the votes. I offered an amendment that I have actually offered before in this committee. I've worked on it for three years with uh, Dr. John Lott, hmm. author of uh, More Guns, Less Crime, right. um, and several other good books that go through the statistics. He pointed out to me that if you are a black male, you, you share within racial and ethnic groups, we share common names. If you're Irish, you might have an Irish name. For instance, if you're African-American, you may have a name that's similar to other African-Americans if you're Hispanic. And, and what happens as a result of that, because the Nick's background check is so sloppy, 
they go by phonetic spellings. They don't go by your exact birthday <laughs> or your exact uh, spelling of your name. If you have a name that's similar to somebody who's been convicted of a crime that's punishable, maybe this person didn't even serve that period of time, but if it's punishable by more than a year, that person, your doppelganger by right. by name only, right? Um, uh, if they're in trouble, now you're in trouble when you try to buy the gun, you get denied. And a lot of these denials can't get overturned on the first pass. Like, there's several levels of denial. And in many cases, people walk away without ever exercising their Second Amendment. Law-abiding law citizens who share a name similar to somebody who's been convicted, this happens three times more frequently, the false denial for black males. Two huge, huge point. Two yeah. times as frequently for uh, point. Hispanic males. And, and they collect this data on the Form 4473, and they've never released it. Really? The... I'm not I don't want to know your personally identifiable identifiable information, but statistically they should let us know how many denials happen by race, by age and by sex. Those three things are already con collected on that form. I've asked the FBI director to give it to us. They haven't. They, uh, I've asked the, the, um, the GAO to get it for us and they promise it and they haven't gotten it. Uh, so my amendment says give us the data. Just you have to print the the denials give us a report on denials statistically not individually by race age and sex offered that amendment and um, because i've talked to sheila jackson lee about this before mm. she knew this amendment when she saw it and she told nadler he should accept it and he did mm. now i there thought they'd do some trickery and <laughs> and just like throw the amendment away tell me they would accept it, it lo and behold it made it into the final bill the gun yeah. The gun when it came to the floor, there were six bad gun control provisions in this bill and a seventh provision, which was the Massey provision. <laughs> and every Democrat and most Republicans voted for it. It passed wow. 380 to 44. Well, there you go. Um, so, so in a nutshell, over at the ATF for these government agencies, right? If your name's Bill Smith and you yeah. go to buy a gun and you're on that list, you're probably going to have some trouble. Yeah. And who could imagine that from government, right? It's like, <laughs> government messes things up I mean, they can't separate the bill smiths in the country you know so. i think it was i think it was ted kennedy who had trouble getting on airplanes that's right uh because well he should have <laughs> should have had trouble yeah. but on his own volition <laughs> but uh you know he shared a name with some ira terrorist or something yeah <laughs> uh and and this happens so frequently it's there are one hundred and twelve thousand. the last year that we have data for we don't have it by race, age, and sex, but we do have this data. There were 112,000 denials in a year and only 12, only 12 federal prosecutions. Now, if those were all actual justifiable denials, those were people who are prohibited from buying a gun trying to buy a gun. And why did they only prosecute 12 of 112,000 federally? Because they most of those 112,000 were false denials. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, I want to ask you about that here in a minute. Um, you know, what what's on your wish list in the majority? But Gun Free School Zones Act is probably one of them. Uh, talk about top. that bill. I saw you on Laura Ingram on Fox News the other night. Yeah, tell everybody where that's at. You yeah. know, co-sponsors and this and that. And so, um, in 1990, Congress did a knee-jerk reaction to uh, you know violence, school shootings. They passed the Gun Free School Zone Act. It's cost more lives than it's saved. Uh, and and the reason we know that is it there are some states and school districts that have overcome the gun free school zone act they've within the school not in the perimeter around it which is where the gun free school zone act applies but within the school they have allowed teachers and staff to carry mm. and in those schools there's never been a shooting there might 100 percent not accidental not a policeman shows up and thinks they see the, sh the shooter and it's a teacher, not the teacher is crazy and the teacher shoots a student. None of these outcomes, the, the you know, apocryphal outcomes that the Democrats predict have happened in those jurisdictions. Mm. It's the one thing we could do to save lives. So I've got a bill that would repeal the Gun Free School Zone Act. It's called the Safe Students Act. Uh, we have probably about 20 co-sponsors in the House. Believe it or not, there's no Democrats. <laughs> right. And and you may be saying, well, why do we need that if states can already overcome it? Well, number one, I don't think it should be the default 
the fed, the national default to advertise every school as a, a a soft target with sitting ducks for you know insane individuals. So uh, number two, even in the states that have overcome the Gun Free School Zone Act and allowed teachers and staff to carry, there's still this gray area around the school. You know, the Gun Free School Zone Act pr provides for a perimeter, a certain distance from the school, and a parent who's just coming to pick a kid up for a dentist appointment could be in federal violation of this, when in fact, the parent should be able to have that gun in that car. They're more, you know, they're safer in that circumstance. So we don't want to make criminals out of the people in the areas that allow them in the schools, you know, but right. either you're out on the <laughs> sidewalk next to it and now you're a criminal because you're not in the school. So Gun Free Schools Act repeal would solve all that. So just rip it away from federal law, get rid of it. My former boss, Congresswoman Green, an ally of yours, she has a compelling story about this back yeah. in Georgia. And I guess she's in high school, maybe in, in the early 90s. And I encourage people to go and watch that online as well. I mean, because that that happened right when that law passed. And so, you know, put, what, put points together. And One other interesting thing about that law, it got repealed by the Supreme Court for a while. Really? Okay. Yes. I, uh, I think it was uh, Lopez was the, the defendant, U.S versus Lopez um, and the Supreme Court ruled that the the bill was unconstitutional because it presumed to cover all guns, including guns that hadn't traveled in interstate commerce. Uh -huh. And so there's no provision in the Constitution that allows the federal government to do gun control. So they rely on the interstate commerce clause. Well, they didn't have that specifically stated in the original Gun Free School Zone Act. So it got shot down by the Supreme Court within five years of it happening. And then Congress came back and added a provision that said for guns that have traveled in interstate commerce. Now, the reason I bring that up, Patrick, is uh, the Democrats introduced these six gun control bills, and some of them have that clause that says guns that have traveled in interstate commerce, and some do not. Okay. And <laughs> in fact, the one that's self-conflicting is the 3D printed guns by definition, when that gun comes into existence, unless you're 3D printer, like you're walking across the bridge from one state to another or something while it's printing, it hasn't traveled in interstate commerce. So the is on its face, that is unconstitutional because of that 1995 Supreme Court ruling. And because some of these gun bills concede that they could only regulate guns that have traveled in interstate commerce, they point out that the ones who don't, the bills that don't have that in it are unconstitutional already. Wow. Okay. Hint, hint, if you are a Supreme Court justice and you're watching this. <laughs> oh, we might have a decision over here pretty soon on a couple of- uh, Yeah, New York. Yeah, yeah a, lot, a lot of stuff. So I want to go back to 1718 real quick. I know you were here. Um, we had- In the year 1718? <laughs> yeah. 2017 and 2018. Oh, okay. Paul Ryan speaker. Yeah. Mitch McConnell over in the Senate. Donald Trump, Republicans are controlling all of government, you know, and it's like, hey, we've we've we got the power, baby. Let's let's rip this place apart. Let's tear across, apart federal gun control. That's not what happened. We got mm. bump stocks. We got fixed nicks, and then I think a little bit later we got a lot of red flag talk. So you were here, you know, yeah. just kind of give us a feel of, you know, maybe maybe even more than what what happened. If you even remember more of just like. When when the swamp yeah. takes over, yeah. what happens? Yeah, let know? me go backwards. Okay, for, good. Chronologically, the, because the most recent one I remember is the bump stock ban that right. happened administratively in the Trump administration. Right. And um, what really happened there behind the scenes is my colleagues wanted the problem to go away. They and they didn't want to vote on it. Now, Congress is like literally the first sentence in the Constitution after the little preamble there is that all legislative power is, is given to Congress. You can't give it away. Yet that's what happened with the bump stock ban. The um, ATF basically made a law. So they violated the Constitution, in my opinion. But the reason they were driven to do that with Trump as their boss was that the uh, Republicans in Congress went to Trump. In fact, former head of the Judiciary Committee, I don't want to say his name, but he's no longer in Congress. We'll look him up it's not guys. Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan's great. Okay. 
but went <laughs> went went to Donald Trump, and they had a few little hearings, like private hearings here that were never televised where the ATF came in and explained what a bump stock is. Mm. And they could have done it legislatively, but they begged Trump to do it administratively. And that's why that happened. Should have been a vote. And maybe we could have won that vote because we were in the majority, or at least you would have known which Republicans were for banning bump stocks and you could have got rid, rid of them so that they don't then stay around and pass red flag laws. Like we need to identify these folks and get rid of them in primaries. So uh, that's what happened on the bump stock. Fix Nicks. That was a mess. You can't, number one, you, they don't want to fix Nicks. They can't fix Nicks. Right. Uh, there's so many false denials, and the, and the argument was to add more people to the list. Well, they want to dump like everybody on the no fly zone in there, anybody mm. in any government database. Obama tried this with Social Security. Um, we were able, fortunately, to countermand that using a provision that allows Congress to repeal administrative rules within six months. You're almost never able to do it because if you repealed it, the president wouldn't sign your repeal. And so you're trying to countermand a president and then mm. he has to sign the countermand. It doesn't happen. There's, but with Obama, he did the Supreme or the Social Security ban in his last few months of office. It, it went into effect. And so when, when Trump uh, took over and we we're in the majority, we were actually able to use that provision. I'm telling you about the Social Security gun ban, which almost happened because that's the kind of thing they want to do with fixed NICs is they want to take those databases like at the VA and the Social Security right. office where they've not they've really been, been adjudicated mentally incompetent, but somebody in order to get their benefits, whether it's Social Security or VA benefits, has to say on a form, I don't manage my own money. They flag that. This, and and say, okay, that's an indicator that you are not mentally fit. Anyways, so the way they got fixed, Nick's through the house is they attached it to something that's well, popular, we which is the uh, <laughs> constitutional carry. Uh, national uh, reciprocity. Sorry, national reciprocity. Yeah. I want to do national constitutional carry. Yeah, why not? Why not? It's like, yeah. <laughs> anyways, uh, but national reciprocity, they attached the two bills together with uh, in a with a rule in the rules committee. And I went around and was able to get enough votes to separate those two bills. And then outside groups got involved. Some people got confused about what I was doing. And the uh, Republican leadership was able to keep those two bills together instead of having separate votes. That passed. Everybody did a little happy dance. And I said, you just shot yourselves in the foot, folks, uh, because that's never going through the Senate. And every one of you just voted to expand the Nick's background check system in a way that's broken. And so what happened very shortly thereafter, exactly what I said ha would happen. They added it to like an omnibus bill in the Senate, the, the Nick's provision, Nick's expansion, and uh, brought it to the House. And Republicans had already voted for it in another bill. So they couldn't use that as an excuse not to vote for the spending bill. It became law. I, when we walk the halls of Congress, we meet with some of your colleagues who you'll know, I hear about this story with the fixed necks and national reciprocity and just jack, it just jack, jack things up. I mean, and, and I hear about that story more than any other over the last three or four years. Just like, why do we make things so complicated? Why do we make things so difficult? It's so simple, you know, but, and, and that kind of leads me into the, <clears throat> excuse just think, me. Just think if you'd had a Thomas Massey here in 1986, <laughs> <laughs> when they pla passed McClure, McClure yeah. uh, Volmer Act, and somebody by a voice vote or something snuck in the uh, the prohibition on NFA items from '86 and, and uh, afterwards. I mean, that's the kind of chicanery that happens here. And then when you're the good guy, and you, you know you're trying to stop bad legislation. And you're trying to point things out. Uh, if somebody had done that back then, somebody would have been yelling at him because you know what that 86 bill did? It allows you to do to travel interstate right. with a firearm. Mm -hmm. Very popular provision. And they stuck that other thing in it. Congress needs to vote on this stuff separately or else you're going to take one step forward and two steps back with every vote. <laughs> Speaking, speaking of Congress again, you're in Congress, obviously. Looks like Republicans are going to win in November. Big majorities, you know, is it is it 225 or is it 250, 260? Is it 240? I don't know. If you are in charge. If it's 219, <laughs> it's going to be really fun. Because, it's going to be fun, right? Because the Massey caucus will control the majority. 
Exactly. Vote. And everybody out there watching, if you think about that for a minute, it takes what, 218 to elect yeah, a two, speaker two, yeah. and things like that. So the closer it is, maybe the more fun we can have. So something to keep an eye on. But if you were in charge in your perfect world, what, you know, I'm putting you on the spot, what would you do oh. Second Amendment wise? What's on the top of your, your wish list if you could get it? To get the policy we want, and we need the process to be okay. fixed. And the in order to get my wish list, we we need to separate the bills. Otherwise, they're going to be you know in in the uh, in the house on the floor. They shouldn't be taking two bills that have nothing to do with each other and sticking them together. And we need to fix the spending bills. So, for instance, Patrick, you could uh, I call these three letter agencies the pet snakes, the ATF, DOJ, FDA, CDC. Uh, just go down the line. We feed them and take care of them when we're in the majority and when we have the White House. And then we wonder why they bite us when we go into the minority or the White House changes hands. Um, the way you get the behavior you want, because we've already given them way too much authority to make regulation, is you countermand it with cutting their funding or prohibiting them from doing things with funding uh, you know, none of the funds hereby appropriated shall be used to do X. That's my favorite form of legislation. And you can't do that effectively inside of an omnibus because you get blamed for shutting down the government because mm, you right. insisted on your provision. But if you pass a separate bill that funds the national parks and a separate one that funds NASA and one that funds the roads, separate all these bills, send them to Joe Biden. If he doesn't sign it, he gets blamed for shutting down the roads or the national parks or NASA. Okay. But then when you get to the bill that funds the ATF, you stick 10 things in there. Mm. None of the funds hereby appropriate shall be used for X. Now, the problem with those type of amendments, they only last as long as the funding lasts. And we'd rather have permanent law, but you're not going to get that with Joe Biden as president. We've got so we've got a period of two years. We've got to be smart. We've got to we get to control the process. So we should do. And by the way, I'm not saying to rig the process. I'm saying go back to the process the founders intended. Let's just even go back to the 80s and 90s where they right. did process. And if we use the right process, we can actually make, we won't be on defense when Joe Biden is president and we're in the majority. Speaking of the ATF, you talked about the bump stocks and that was Republican regulatory, mm -hmm. you know, stuff. And, um, you know, now we have, I think in August, uppers and lowers, the ATF and all sorts of stuff they're gonna be doing. It's almost like and also the the brace the brace it's so, almost like republicans just you said shoot ourselves in the foot you know not not literally but like when we do and i'm a republican when when we do things that then the democrats just jump all over and of, well of course the president can do things for the atf trump did it right the Trump administration did it you're in the congress and, and i think people want to understand like why does the atf exist well it's because the congress I think gave them the power to exist. Oh, absolutely. And, and you're gonna have oversight in the next Congress. Let's bring these people in. Let's ask questions. Let's find out who's making decisions. And hopefully you're on judiciary yeah. and you can do this. Look, the, the ATF isn't in the constitution. No. The, uh, <laughs> the, the FBI isn't in the constitution. The attorney general isn't in the constitution. All of these elements of the executive branch are creations of Congress. We created the ATF, we created the FBI, we created all of these things. And um, we are therefore uh, responsible for their oversight. And that's something that we can do when we're in the majority and don't yet have the White House is oversight. And we need to be digging into all of this. What All of the three letter agencies need to be held accountable and, and answer us instead of stonewalling us. Absolutely. Last year, I was here more than I am now. I was I was with Congresswoman Green. I saw some of the crazy. By the way, I I love Marjorie Taylor Green. Just yeah, don't we all? Out. Right. I mean, but but I, I like her for a reason that a lot of other people can't claim, and that is, uh, you know, I used to be the most hated person in Washington D.C. <laughs> it's a badge she's of honor. She's taken that from me. At, well, not completely. I'm just the most hated man now. Okay. Well, there you go. There you go. Well, um. You know, I saw, you know, I'd been around Congress and state level politics and this and that, and I knew it was crazy, but I didn't realize just how rigged the system and how crazy it is. And, you know, I felt privileged, you know, when I look back on it to be around Marjorie and, and, and Massey and Gates, who I think y'all kind of found like, 
hey, we don't really care about what the swamp says and we're independently minded and you kind of just found each other and you fought a lot of battles mm -hmm. with each other. You know, if, if gun owners are out there and, and they, they get it, the system's rigged, whatever, like we need more of those independently minded people. Yes, you can be a Republican, whatever, but um, how important in your mind and, and the, the, the quote that Samuel Adams, I don't know if it's real or not, but it's a small minority setting brush fires in people's minds. And I felt like looking back on it, that's what y'all do. You're still, in a, you're still doing it to this day. And hopefully there's some more reinforcements coming in. Yeah, in we've, 23. we've, we've got some reinforcements. Um, they're great to some of their names. You don't know some of them you do know my co-chair now, I used to be the benevolent dictator right. of the second amendment caucus. Yes. Um, uh, but uh, I entered into a power sharing arrangement with Lauren Boebert. Right. Uh, and our deal is she's the co-chair and does all the work. And there I you get, go. And I, Smart. And huh? I get half the credit. <laughs> of course, now that I've disclosed our deal, probably people won't give me any credit anymore. But um, no, there's there's other good people um, and people who've been in the trenches with me for as long as I've been here, like Paul Gosar. Mm. And, love, and, love Gosar. and Andy Biggs, who uh, came on a little later but has been in the trenches with us. Um, we fought a lot of these battles together before the new folks got here. I'm looking forward to new ones who are coming. Um, I just met J.R. Majewski from up around Cleveland. Isn't it like, hey, uh, you thought 22 was crazy. How about, yeah. or 20 was crazy. How about 20? I'm not saying he's crazy. I'm just no. like, crazy's good to me. Right. I mean, well, you know. anything anything that's sane outside of the Beltway looks crazy inside of the Beltway. Exactly. So we we need um, some more of those. He's very independently minded, and, and there's there are a dozen candidates out there like that. There are a dozen here whose names you don't really know because we've not really had a lot of fights. But here's what they're in for. That and a lot of them don't know this now. Folks like uh, Andy Biggs and Paul Gosar know this because they've been here when this happens, but when we get in the majority, too too often when these issues come up, like let's say the media spins up, you know, this narrative of gun violence, which is just violence. The guns aren't committing it, but they do that. When Republicans are in the majority, there's going to be a tendency when people say Congress has to do something for the House to do what the Senate's doing right now, which is to do something. And, uh, and oftentimes it's to negotiate our surrender. And then you're going to get mm. pressure. And, um, you know, I've been here when we're in the majority. And the, Louis Gomer once told me we were in a conference and, and they were using a football analogy. And they were like, all right, Republicans, <laughs> when, you know, when the quarterback, you know, snaps the ball, you're all on the same team, you know. And, and Louis Gomer leaned over to me. And he says, if the quarterback runs for the wrong end zone, I ain't blocking for him. <laughs> In fact, I might have to tackle him. Right. <laughs> if they're trying to score for the other team. Are they on your team? So, um, but they're going to be in a new situation where they get whipped. Uh, and, you know, nobody in the last three years, with the exception of some of the stuff Trump wanted while Pelosi was speaker, but for the most part, no Republican while uh, Pelosi has been speaker has gotten yelled at by the Republican uh, whip structure and leadership team. They've not had their max donors call them up and say, if they haven't you don't, seen that yet. They haven't seen, they haven't got a call from Joe back home right. who they've known for five years. Joe's a max donor, solid as a rock. And Joe is telling them to get on the team and vote with Republicans. But Joe has been sold a line, you know, bill of goods by the leadership or somebody got to Joe and they're getting, you know, they haven't, this hasn't happened to them yet and it's going to happen. Ugh. And, this is when we'll sort sort them out and we, but but you're right we need we need enough good people so that when the, if if our team runs for the wrong end zone we can say nope you don't have 218 it, it's funny um you know it, it, not funny but during covid it was november right after I was, I was with the congresswoman she wasn't a congresswoman yet and, and you'll you'll understand this they have what's called orientation right freshman orientation for like 45 year old men and women um like high school again right and this is what you do this is what you do and because it was COVID, i think we were sequestered i was a staff official staff I mean, we were sequestered over at like one of the hotels down here and they they put you on a bus and you go back and forth to the Capitol and you go through basically like lessons not only for staff but for members and so i witnessed it in the minority and um, you know, there's a speaker's vote and 
Um, I, I would see tweets like, I'm not going to name any names. So-and-so has just been named to the whip team as a freshman. And I'm like, I remember talking to my colleague. I was like, oh, he's gone. I thought he was good. He's gone. And um, I can only imagine the pressures in the majority with the power of maybe the purse in the Congress and committee assignments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, like people getting cornered, you know, hey, come have coffee with us. We need to talk like that. That is how the swamp works, right? Yeah. And they hand out merit badges like uh, uh, conference chair, yes. conference messaging chair. I call it like executive vice deputy prom queen to the <laughs> whip, you know, to the majority whip. Like right. they create all these titles and there's almost enough titles to go around to everybody. And they give you a, a merit badge as if like, you know, I understood the motivation for that in Cub Scouts. Uh, but why grown adults, men and women will sell their souls for a little badge or a jacket that says something on it or a tie or a pair of socks that's got the GOP logo on it. <laughs> it's oh, got an elephant on it. Yeah. You, you know, I don't understand that. Uh, you know, I, when I got here, I was a chairman, believe it or not, it's hard for me to even say this, almost unbelievable to me. I was a chairman of a subcommittee my my first term. Really? Okay. Well, I should say for the first three months of my first term, <laughs> okay. they once they found out who I was mm. and that I meant what I campaigned on, they dissolved the subcommittee on science. There science, was, okay. There used to be a separate technology uh, subcommittee and the science committee and they made me the subcommittee chair because I had gone to MIT had two degrees in engineering technology science. let's put the <laughs> MIT guy on as the chairman of technology that lasted uh, until I voted against John Boehner for speaker and then they were very polite about it they uh unlike with Marjorie where they just kicked her off all her committees um they made her more popular. Though. They made her more popular. I think they knew that might have the same effect with me. So to deprive me of that notoriety, they just they just merged the technology subcommittee with another subcommittee and eliminated my position. Mm, that's what happens. In but the like with but, but as with Marjorie, it gave me more time. Yeah. To look at the things that mattered. Yeah. Yeah. You know, last questions here, and, it, and it's, I love it. I know you love it. I think I remember maybe seeing a, an ad for you eight, nine years ago or something. You're like with the Kentucky Hills in the background. You got something. I don't even remember what it was. Maybe full auto. I don't know. Maybe not. But, um, and then now in 2020, they have. And by the way, I always love it when I'm holding an M16. <laughs> yeah. And uh, people say, oh, he needs more accessories on that AR. <sighs> and they don't realize it's got the one accessory that. <laughs> yeah the switch the only one that matters yeah right? but it used to be the orange vest and the fresh orange vest elmer fudd campaign photo like you know shotgun over your shoulder or whatever and then marjorie comes in and it's like we did an ad called save america stop socialism anybody can go back and watch it she blows up uh socialism the green new deal and all this stuff it was great it went viral it was on fox you got bobert and she confronted uh uh Beta, Beta or Beta yeah. or whatever his name is. That was like a big moment, I think, for her. And she had the gun cafe and all this stuff. So like it has to make you feel good that like we're using long black guns and campaign ads and not just like the, you know, single shotgun like marching yeah. through the creek or whatever. You know? By the way, I'm kind of an amalgamation <laughs> of all those ads. Okay. Like I did one with my daughter. Years ago. I did one with my daughter. Okay. We're we're wearing the orange stuff, but she's carrying a, an AR style rifle. And uh, I think I was too, but uh, well, it's a different era. I mean, you know, I don't know if you were Tea Party era, if you would call yourself that. Um, I just think that this is Tea Party 2.0, and socialism is really here. I know a lot of us maybe define socialism different than you do. All of it's socialism, but like the country is really <laughs> wait, on the line. <laughs> wait, I'm a little bit older than you, so I'm going to go back even in even further. To 1994 okay because there was the tea party wave in 2010 mm. and i i was actually running for local office when mm. when that wave came and then i came sort of like the last of the tea party wave to arrive in congress i won a special election in 2012 but before that when i was paying attention to politics where i first started was 1994 and the republican revolution right. where we we took control of the house for the first time in decades and um, people who've lived through that 94 experience and the 2010 experience 
say that what we feel now it feels more like the 94 experience which by the way was more sort of consequential um mm. the, the people they got elected and they didn't sell out as quickly as sort of the, some of the tea party congressmen did um you know what that they, was fast what they I see some of them walking the k street and around the hill anyways I won't here's go here's no here's <laughs> some what some of the tea party guys yeah yeah they're already <laughs> lobbyists uh, there, there are people that came in the Tea Party wave, already did a little stint here in Congress, sold out, and they're already lobbyists. It didn't take them long. Yeah. But um, this, this, you know, in in 2010, if you remember, Obama was president. Right. And what happened is the Tea Party wave was told, "Cool your jets," because I heard the same thing. We got to win back the White House. So the excuse for not doing really that much in 20 you know when we took the majority in 2010 operationally in 2011 okay january 3rd of 2011 was we got to win the white house so john boehner said no drama we got to win the white house well we don't win the white house right obama wins his next term and so the story is you know we gotta we can't do anything until we win the white house and it was always an excuse not to do the right thing and that's what, just in closing here, that's what we've got to resist when we take the majority um, is trying to play defense or safety because we think we're going to win the White House if all we do is nothing. Right. No, that's the recipe for losing the White House. When we take the majority, we have to fight. We have to show people what, how we will fight if we get the White House, not how we negotiate the surrender when we're in charge. So that's what we got to do. Guys, Congressman Thomas Massey of Kentucky, chairman of the Second Amendment Caucus. You heard it, one of the good guys in Congress. I know you're busy, Congressman. Thanks for coming on. It was a long show, um, but but I think it's very insightful. And if, and everybody out there watching, if you haven't watched The Swamp on HBO a few years ago was filmed, yes. please watch that. You'll really get an insight as to what goes on up here. Or, or if you want to get an insight into what I do back in Kentucky, watch Off the Grid Off with the grid? Thomas Massey. Okay, yeah. cool. That one's free. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Right. Thanks, Congressman. Thanks, Patrick. Appreciate it.